to his promises as he demonstrate or as we demonstrate our faith and commitment to serve God and to know and to do his will. Now, most of us have favorite scripture verses. And uh, you hear people quoting all kinds of scripture verses these days. And they always pick one for their own convenience. And they always give you part of the verse and half the time not all of the verse. But so <clears throat> what are some of the most famous uh, scripture verses you hear people quote these days? Psalms 23, the Lord is my shepherd. And uh, I think one of the most, the number one would be what? John 3, 16. I mean, you see that ball games. You see it everywhere you go, John 3, 16. And some of them messed it up, you know. But John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. What did he do? gave his one and only son. Sometimes you hear people quote uh, John 14, 1. Some people can quote the first seven verses of John 14. You know, <clears throat> let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house, if it were not so, I told you, I go. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again to receive you to myself so that where I am, there you may be. That's a promise from God. Do you believe it? Yes. Then Philippians 4.19. Oh, people love that one. For my God to supply all our needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Some of us have we mistaken that. For God will supply all my wants. It's not what he says. And then, of course, you see this. A lot of athletes will have this one. Uh, Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. And old people, you need to cling to that verse when the pain comes. Amen? How about Proverbs chapter 3? Five to six. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't hang back. With all your heart. And lean not on your own understanding. In all of your ways. And he will make your path straight. You hear that? He's the one who makes your path. Somebody said that God draws straight lines with crooked. Uh, there are straight line with crooked, uh, something like that. <laughs> but you know what happened when some of us hear these verses? We switch off. Because we say, we know those. We know those verses. So we let our minds wander. And you know what they say about that? Familiarity breeds contempt. We're so familiar with the words that we said, ah, we don't need to tell me that. I know it. And we miss out because really when you hear somebody say that, don't tell me I know that, that means they're really not practicing it. And it upsets them when, you, when they hear the words. So they switch off. But that's why we need to pay a, a careful uh, and close attention to God's word. Otherwise, we can become very cold. You know, we, people call themselves Christian, and they're miserable, some of them. Why? Because they're not letting the word of God dwell richly in their hearts. You see, they become hardened, and they begin to be judgmental. And they always see what the other person is doing, and not what they're doing. And so they become disinterested. And if we are, if we allow ourselves to be callous when we hear the word of God, we are on a slippery road to spiritual suicide. So please pay close attention to what God wants us to say this morning as we look at Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 5 to 6. 
so that we may learn how to make wise decisions that will change our trajectory in 2024. And of course, being a Baptist preacher, you always have a story. Uh, this morning I have one for you. I heard a story of a woman who was driving through the mountains of West uh, uh, Denver when she ran into, you know, Denver and Colorado, there's a lot of mountainous stuff. And she ran into a snowstorm and she got totally lost. But as she peeked and tried to find her way and find the markings on the road, she noticed she saw a flashing, little flashing light. It was a snowplow. And she decided to follow her and to keep very close to this snowplow. And she, sometimes she almost lost it because the, 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 the snow that was coming off the, the plow was so much. And, and so, but she, she decided to stick with it. And as time, the snow almost cut her, her view off, but she continues to use the snowplow as her, her, her uh, faithful guide to lead her on her way. After a while, the snowplow stopped, and the driver got out, walked over to her car, and asked her, lady, where are you going? She said, I'm on my way to Denver. And he said, well, you'll never get to Denver following me because I'm plowing a, 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 a parking lot. <laughs> you see, if you want to get where you're going, you need to make sure you're on the right path, you're on the right road. Therefore, you and I need to follow the one whose desire is to lead us onto the right path of life. We need to desire God's will. And the one who says, I am the way, I am truth, and I am life. And if you want life, you got to follow me. Because all roads does not lead to heaven. You all know that. With the help of uh, Pastor Bill this morning, I want to explore this passage with you. You see, God is not playing tic-tac go with us. Some people think that God's will is something we have to search and we have to, oh, agonize over. But did you know that God takes great joy in revealing his will to you? What kind of God would he be if he hides things from you? That you have to search and agonize to find them. People say, oh, I, you know, I'm just waiting on the Lord. <laughs> What are you waiting on the Lord for? Everything he wants you to do is in his book. It's here. This is your map. This is what we follow if we want to spend eternal life with Almighty God. All of his plans, all of his purpose is in the book. And if we are serious about following Christ, we need to get back to the Bible. You know, all that I'm hearing these days is people preaching and teaching on how to be a better you. You will never be a better you until you have Jesus Christ in your heart and life. Never. They're coming up with all kinds of this plan and this number and this number. You do X, 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 and you'll be the complete human being. Really? You forget you're sinful? That it's not until you've been washed in the blood and given directed by the Holy Spirit that you become fully you or what you're supposed to be in Christ. Now, if we're going to look at that to get the wisdom of God about how to live our lives, we need to dismiss some of the fables and the myth that's going on about God's will. There's always somebody giving you three reasons or four reasons or five reasons why you can find God's will. Everybody have their little package. But if we're going to get real, we need to dispel some of those myths. The first myth that we hear about is that God's will is hard to find. Oh, I've been seeking, I've been searching, I can't find it. 
as if God is hitting it, hitting it deep in Africa and put you in America for you to travel to find his will. It's right here, beloved. Right here. Our verse says what? Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not to your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him. And what's he going to do, beloved? He will make your path straight. You don't have to go search up and down under the bed and wherever else. So many of us are struggling to, to define what God's will for our life is, is or what God's will in every, any given situation. We need to realize that much of God's will and what God wants you to do is already in his book. As a matter of fact, you know, if you look at the Old Testament, the Old Testament, Paul says, was written for our learning. That's God's plan over here. And God has picked out a, 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 a group of people and work his will through them and show you how it works. And so Paul said, we need to go back to the Old Testament to see how God works and then know how he will work in our lives. It's not just, you know, picking a little flower, oh, this is God's will. No, no, this is not God's will. This is God. No. It's like when, you know, when you were young and you see a girl you like, fellas, and girls, you see a boy you like, you know, you pick that, remember, the, I forgot what the flower was called. Forget me now? It's a love little flower, right? So you used to go, he loves me, he loves me not, he loves me. No, no, you don't have to do that with God's will. God loves you unconditionally. You need to get with it. Everything God wants you to do is already revealed in his Bible. And God has used somebody to work it out in his life to see if he could do this in this man's life, hey, Hey, he'll do it for me. And when we do that, you know, Proverbs 6, verse 22 says this about God's word. Listen to this. When you walk about, they will guide you. Did you hear that? If you're in the Bible. When you walk about, it will guide you. When you sleep, they will watch over you. And when you awake, they will talk to you. What more do you want to know? You hear what the Bible says? God's word will guide us. God's word will protect us. And God's word will speak to us. So are you hearing God's word this morning? Are you hearing his word? Are you reading and meditating on God's word that's already written down to guide us as we seek his will and as we grow in grace? and knowledge and wisdom of God's word. God warns us about honoring him. God warns us about the kind of friends we keep. God warns us to honor our parents because out of that come a blessing. God warns us to and, 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 and teaches us to take care of one another. God tells you that his desire, that is that we live in peace and harmony with our neighbors. And on and on it goes in the word of God. But some of us are struggling around, are staggering around, claiming that we are trying to find the will of God. And we forget that God has already revealed himself in his word. You know, it, it makes me just sometimes shake my head when people say, I'm really searching for God's will for my life, you know. You say, are you reading the Bible? No, but I'm praying. I'm praying. Well, beloved, the best prayer you can have is when you read God's word. And sometimes you just read it back to him. Get to the psalm and find one that suits your situation and just say, Lord, this is what you promise. And may I remind you that I'm your child. Will you do this for me, Lord? And he will. Another fallacy that we read, uh, how we need to identify and destroy, is that we think that God wants us to know the future. Unfortunately, most of us, when we think that 
the Bible is not enough, we go to somebody else. And we go to some people who live in this little dinky house. When you go in there, the bushes are all over the place. It's in a mess. And this is the person we go to to tell us the future. Now, you tell me, if they can't know that their future is, how are they going to know what your future is? Well, God does not reveal what's coming next week, next month, or next year. Do you know that? Why? Because God's want to encourage us to take the next step in faith. You see, we, we don't walk by sight. We don't walk because we know what's going to happen tomorrow. Because we'll never get to tomorrow. And then in Proverbs 6 and verse 23 says, For the commandment is a lamp and a teaching, and the teaching is light. You hear that? God's commandment is a lamp. And God's teaching is light. And God's teaching is not about a floodlight or a flashlight. You know, you switch it on and you, you can see your way. Is this working? Yeah. You can see your way and you can see down yonder. God's way is not a flashlight. It's not a, it's not a, it's not a floodlight that you see everything around you. No, he's talking about someone who's walking in a darkened trail. And the only light they have is an old oil lamp. See that? Look at it. This only gives you how much light. Enough light to make the next step. And then it gives you a chance to see where the next step is going to be. That's called walking by faith. You don't see it all. It, the light glows just around you. And just to direct, what did it say? Direct your path. When, we, when he takes a step, you can confidently say that the next time is going to be solid, but you don't know what the next one might be. So God's word is for, to direct you to take the next step. So God leads this way because he wants us to trust him little by little, step by step. That's living in the light of his word. Amen. Unfortunately, we're all in a rush. And we want instant gratification. We want it now. Lord, just send a floodlight. Yeah, and I hear people pray that. Lord, send a floodlight. God said, all I'm giving you is a little lantern. Okay? And sometimes you've got to hold it close to your head to see. Why? Because you've got to pay attention, you see. You got to pay attention to where God's leading. But you know, we love to brag. Oh Lord, just lead me all the way. And you're looking around. No, no, no. When God's leading, you got to concentrate. Because you only have a little lantern. And some of you probably don't remember this because you've gotten too sophisticated. But I remember living in the country. And when you go home, we used to have what they call a bottle torch. And you used to walk like this. Because that's the only way you're going to see the path. Mm -hmm. God said, that's the way I lead. you got to follow the path. And you got to rely on me to make the next step. And it don't come all at once. Because every time you make a step and you, 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 you find yourself on solid ground, you, you're emboldened, right, to take the next step. Because by faith, you're saying the next step is going to be even solid. More solid or solider? <laughs> and then you have a confidence that every step of the way, my Savior leads. What am I? 
the ask beside. Amen. He leads me tenderly. He leads me faithfully. Now, the third myth is that we think that we have to be 100% sure before we make a move. We got all we got to get all the money on the table before we do anything. Hmm. You know what this can cause, don't you? Anxiety. Somebody said paralysis. You're probably right. It can cause you anxiety and serious stress. Trust in God means we put our faith in him, even though we may not have all the questions answered. Even though we might not be absolutely sure, but we just know because of what he had done in the past, I'm here, and I'm keep on going. You see. Don't wait for everything to be just perfect. Because there will never be. You're imperfect. And so is the world that you live in. Nothing is going to be perfect 100%. Because half the time, 100%, by the time you get 100%, whatever the opportunities are long gone. You see, God wants us to step out in faith. And when we do, we will find what Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 9 says is true. It says, the mind of man plans his way, but the Lord direct his steps. Not even his way, his steps. Bring me back to the light, right? He directs your step when you make the plans and you step out in faith. God, I don't know where I'm going to lead me, but I feel within my spirit this is the way, and I'm going to walk. The fourth misconception is that God's greatest goal for me is for me to be happy. How many times you hear that? God's greatest goal is for me to be happy and to have everything I need. As conscious 21st I should have said conscientious. Uh, 21st century people, many of us have caught up in the fallacy that we deserve to be happy and successful. Unfortunately, that's what you hear in these days, especially in churches. Trust God and you're going to have everything you need. Trust God and you're going to have money in the bank, big fancy car, and a house on the hill. You know, what they don't realize is that they never give houses on the hill too, you know. Many think that God's major work in our life is to make us happy. But that's wishful thinking, beloved. Why do you think they call Jesus the man of sorrow and acquainted with grief, if that's true? If anybody should have been happy in this world, it would have been Jesus, wasn't it? But the burden of our sin weighed on him. Because he knew that we won't listen and we want the easy way out. And he come to show us that the way is not always straight and plain and uh, fancy asphalt on the road. Some, some of those roads have potholes. You know. And, and, and the devil set traps along the way. Not on the way, but along the way. Right? You see, God is committed to what? Not to make you happy. He is committed to our holiness, not our happiness. Because that's, that is so because what? Sometimes he allows us to go through some tough spots. If he was overly concerned with our happiness, that wouldn't have been. But he's not overly concerned about our happiness. You know what he's really concerned about? Your holiness. Jesus said, be ye holy as your father is holy. God is concerned that we be holy. And so he allows us to go through some tough spots because he knows also that those tough spots are going to give us muscles, spiritual muscles. 
A lot of us spend so much time worrying about what God wants to do in our lives or where he wants us to live. People are saying, you know, I'm praying that the Lord will just show me where he wants me to live. Go live anywhere you want to. Oh, I'm just, you know, I saw this house, but I'm praying that God, this is the house God has for me. Really? You think God don't have nothing else to do but walking around searching to find you a house? Are you a car? So instead of focusing on our vocation and our location, concentrate on your personal transformation. God wants you to be transformed into the image of his son. And he's going to do everything that is possible to help you to be transformed into the image of Jesus. So what is God's will for our lives? 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 3 says, For this is the will of God. Paul make his play. You want to know what the will of God is? Listen to the Bible. This is the will of God. Your sanctification. What does that mean, class? It is God's will for you to be holy. That's his will. And to be holy, you got to get into the word. And to avoid everything that is against God's will. Everything flows out of that, beloved. Everything flows up out of the life we're living in Christ. Living a holy life is what pleases the Father and open up the door to his supply. My God shall supply. How? When I am living according to my God's will and purpose for my life. God's not going to bless your mess. He blesses you when you recognize for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. That's his purpose for our lives. Proverbs 3, 5 to 6 says, and it is God's promise to people and every person that have lame, laid claim to Proverbs chapter 3, 5 to 6. Because they are seeking God's direction in their lives. Never lose out. When they take this promise and say, Lord God, I'm going to live according to your purpose. And I'm not going to lean to my own understanding. I'm not going to seek out Tom, Dick, and Harry to tell me how to live. I'm going to live according to your word because you want me to be holy. And you want me to be trusting you every step of the way. There is, and, and when you do that, it'll never fail. Because you can't fail. It's God's promise that when you put your trust in him, When you're leaning on him. When everything that you do. You're doing because you know this is what God wants. You come prayed up. You come read up. Because you read the word. And you pray the word. And you can step out and say no, no Lord God. You said this. I believe it. Here we go. That's when the Spirit of God begins to work powerfully because you're, you're, you're now in God's will. God can't deny himself. He's with you always, even to the end of the world. He said, I'm with you. And everyone who have really take that, those two verses personally and begin to live according to those verses and obey the conditions that God lays out. And by the way, uh, it's not just, most of us, we know five and six, but you know what? You need to read the whole chapter. You really need to do it because it's a context. So from verse 1 to 12 is really the context. God always keeps his promise when we obey his directives. 
because our obedience prepares us to receive and enjoy his plan for our lives. And so if we want to enjoy God's plan and God's guidance for our lives, we must learn God's truth. We've got to be in the Bible. We've got to read it. We've got to let it become the central theme of our, our life is the word of God. We've got to live it practically. We've got to stop listen, leaning to our own understanding and listen to this pop psychology that if you're really God's child, you're going to have everything in this world. This world is not our home. And so most of us spend all our time gathering trinkles and trinkets from this world. Because that's what I call it. They're trinkets. They're not, but they have no value. Instead of investing in heavenly treasures. What are you doing for God? How are you living your life for God? Are you absorbing his word? And then when you find a little nugget, you go and tell a brother or a sister to help them on their way. Are you concerned? God bless you to bless somebody. And when you're living God's life, God's way, oh, there's going to be a lot of folks around you who are going to benefit. Why? Because you can't keep it to yourself. you got to show it and you got to tell it. To enjoy God's plan and guidance, we got to get into God's word. Know his truth. Obey his will. Share his blessings. And realize that if we don't, God don't joke. He's going to discipline us. And if he don't discipline us, then you need to ask yourself this question. Am I a child of God? Because when you step out the line, he's going to get the strap out. And he don't care what political correctness says. Okay? He don't spear the rod. Because he don't have spoiled children. He's going to tell you, I told you this. You didn't do it. You know, like I said again, just look at the Old Testament. We went through the book of Numbers for the past year. And when we look at what could have been and should have been, and mankind didn't learn. And they recognize that every time they transgressed the law of God, God didn't spare the rod. As a matter of fact, the first time when they said, we're not going into the land because there's giants over there and we're afraid of giants. And Joshua and Caleb said, listen, God has given, let's go. They said, didn't you hear what we said, Caleb? There's giants over there. And God said, you saw giants? Okay, I tell you what. Because of your disobedience and because you don't trust me. Here's the wonderful thing about that. God has slain many giants for them before. Open up the Red Sea, they crossed on dry land. Give them manna in, you know, give them, uh, uh, brought them to Mount Sinai, show them his presence, you know, come down a mountain and bless them. And Moses turned his back and they're making idols. And God came down and brought a big strap. And he laid it on them. And then he, he provided for them to lead them. And said, you're not, you're, not, you're not going in there. You're, you're not worthy because you don't trust. You don't trust and you don't obey. And therefore, every one of you who has, who is responsible, because the under 20 was ruled out, but you're supposed to be leaders and laying the pathway for the next generation every one of you going to die so that the generation following you can recognize that if we're going to be the people of God we're going to be have to be obedient to the will of God and the work of God and the word of God so we have to it's no different from us you can call yourself a Christian and the only time you read your Bible is Sunday morning and you don't even read it when you come to church the preacher does you need to be in the word God has some marvelous gifts for you in the word. 
Now, to unpack these two verses, ouch. We need more time because I want to take my time, right? So the next time we meet, we'll, 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 we'll follow through and we really examine these two verses. Trust in the Lord, what it means. With all your heart, what does it mean? Lean not, and so on. We need time for that, beloved. So, you out there who are listening, come and join us the next time when we meet and uh, give others a chance to, to, to worship with you. Give them the link to our, 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 our church and our settings for, on, on our Facebook. Uh, so that we can, we can work this thing together. Until then, will you remember that God is committed to our transformation? God is committed to make you into the image of Jesus Christ. He's, about, he's not about where we live or what our professions are. He's about transforming your life. He's about making you holy so that you can stand before him and give him glory. Sometimes the way may be a little rough, of course, and we may find it hard to navigate. But please remember that once you're committed to follow in God's blueprint, once you've committed to God's blueprint, he will clear the way for you. The straight path is not always easy. But it will always lead us away from sin and distraction and points us to a deeper relationship with Jesus Christ. Sometimes you're going to feel alone on that pathway. People you thought was coming with you really are dropping like flies. And they're wandering off because they like their hearts and their minds to be tickled and they, they run off to the latest thing on the block, which is always emptiness because we always come up empty. So put your trust in Christ. And can I tell you something about him? Easy enough. Easy enough for whatever you're going through right now. Jesus Christ is enough. So will you trust him? And will you stop leaning to your own understanding? And sometimes we lean to our own understanding because the evil one have told us a lie and we believe it. He says, look how long you've been praying. God is not even hearing to you anymore. He ever hear people say, oh, my prayers just seem to be bouncing off the ceiling. Guess what? He says, I am with you. Where is he? He's with you. He's not far off. He's with you. Jesus says when, 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 you, when things get so rough that you can't see me, call on me and I will come to you. I'm here. You're praying and bouncing off no roof. I'm right here listening to you. I am in you. So how can you probably be bouncing off the roof when I'm in you? When I promise to be with you. I'm not a far off. I'm here. Stop wiggling. You know, that little kids always wiggling. You're holding them down on the street and they're wiggling. No, he says, relax. Why? Because I got you. I got you. Will you trust me? Oh, Lord, but it's so hard. He said, as hard as a cross? No, 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 no. This is a different kind of hard. Oh, oh, no. It's not different, beloved. I am with you. I'm the one who dies for you. I'm the one who promised that when things get rough, I will carry you. I will carry you. Will you do that? Until the next time, may God then give you the energy, give you the courage to walk according to his will. And that you will be listening for his voice. 
saying unto you, this is the way. Walk ye in it. Because I am with you. Will you trust God this week? Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for your loving kindness and your tender mercies. That even though we are unfaithful, you are faithful. Even though we are distracted, you are absolutely concerned about our holiness. So make us holy so that we can be beneficiaries of all the manifold grace and purpose that you have for us. Continue to speak to us, O oh Lord, as we continue to be obedient to your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Our hymn is 410. Jesus paid it all. All to him I hope. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength <clears throat> indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. For nothing good have I Whereby the grace to claim I will wash my garments white In the blood of Calvary's Lamb Jesus paid it all All to him I owe Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. And when before the throne I stand in him complete, Jesus died my soul to save, I live just still repeat. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Amen. Father, we thank you that the blood of Christ <coughs> cleansed us from every sin. And we thank you that we believed that those who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved because we believed it. We called. And the blood that washes us from sin is more than enough to wash this away the sins of every human being that is born in our world. Whether in the past or in the future, it was sufficient and it was accepted by you, Father God. So we thank you for those who have heard and have listened. But we also pray for those who are hearing and are taking their time. That you will convince them of the amazing love of Christ that brought him to earth. Stepped out of his heavenly spiritual when he was spirit to become flesh. But we also thank you that there's a man in heaven today with spear wounds and nail wounds as a symbol of what it costs to buy back those who have gone astray, 
those sheep that had wandered off. Thank you for his blood that is sufficient. I pray that somebody will apply that blood to their lives today. And Father, as we left, may the word of God continue to resonate in our spirit and to lift us to a higher place of worship and praise. So as we leave, O oh Lord, surround us with your blessing and give us direction because we believe that you lead us through still waters and you bring us out safely even in the valley of the shadow of death. So give us courage to live boldly this week as when men and women of God. And may our testimony touch someone. Give us a door of opportunity to speak about you and to communicate the joy that we have because of you. So Lord, help us to be faithful this week. Again, open up doors of opportunity to witness to lead the way in the way men and women live who trust in the Lord. May, uh, may us, our testimony, be the warmth that draws somebody to Christ this week. And now, Father God, we pray that you bless each one that is bowed in your presence. May you supply every need and every desire to be a man or a woman of God wherever they live and breathe and have their being. May they be a testimony of your faithfulness. So bless each person today that they will help somebody this week to come to know the joy of the Lord. And we will honor you and praise you as you lead us. So lead on, King Jesus. Amen. Amen.